So while we're connecting here, good morning. It is my great pleasure to be here. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Masood. And also thank you, Darmenda Mora from IBM, um, who put together an outstanding program and got a number of us together who are usually maybe not talking. And my first half hour here is sort of an in-between. Why am I here, a traditional supercomputing guy, and want to talk to you, an audience that is mainly interested in uh, cognitive computing. And so my talk will be sort of a half talk, not a full uh, plenary talk, but an introduction and a welcome, but also a motivator, because I think we're at the threshold of a number of changes in the computer science world and in what's happening in hardware and architecture and in systems that may make this a very productive meeting and maybe the beginning of a final fruitful collaboration between the computer science, architecture, high performance computing people, and the cognitive computing world. So, uh, as I said, NERSC is, stands for the National Energy Research Scientific Computing Center. We are a traditional, and I always like to use the term supercomputer center just to say how it is, not talk about high performance computing and all the other euphemisms. Uh, we're here in Berkeley, up on the hill uh, at Berkeley Lab, collaborating very closely with Citrus and with the computer science department, but we're funded by the Department of Energy. And what NERSC is doing is really what we're calling science-driven computing. We're trying to enable new science, and new science usually refers to the physical science, physics, chemistry, material science, uh, astrophysics, uh, molecular modeling, uh, biology, climate, all these things, and do this with these traditional high-end supercomputers. The names have sometimes changed, sometimes not. This is our newest Cray that just was delivered. Uh, what's important about NERSC is, is that we are a computational facility for open science, so more than half of our users are actually university users. We're supporting the international community. I'm always proud to say, even though we're DOE, we have collaborations with users from more than 90 countries that use our facility. Actually, large user communities, both from Japan and from Europe, uh, who work with us on areas such as high energy physics and nuclear physics. Um, and it's a very large facility with 2,500 users, 300 projects. So again, I will tell you what we're doing, and then I'll say, why am I here? So what we're doing is, I think may, maybe, uh, best explained with an example I'm particularly proud of, uh, George Smoot, who is both a professor of physics here on campus and a scientist at the lab, received the Nobel Prize in 2006 in physics. He is our user, so he's a computer user at the facility. He didn't receive the prize for uh, recent computations, but for work that was done way back in 1992, jointly with John Mather at NASA which was computing for cosmic microwave background radiation, or actually looking at satellite data and doing an analysis of it. And the COBE experiment that was done in 1992, you see sort of an output uh, of the data analysis here, uh, was by our standards today a tiny calculation. Actually, George tells me that the calculation he can assign as a homework assignment to be run on a laptop using MATLAB today. So that's sort of a reflection how much supercomputing has evolved. The computing has evolved, of course, in 1992. That required what we would call today a cluster, a small cluster for alpha processes at that time for the experts. Um, why is that an important calculation? Well, it is because it has data analysis, so at the core of it, for those of you who, of course, have statistical background, we are factoring a very large covariance matrix, and so there's a lot of linear algebra involved. But as computational data have grown and the experiments have grown, this has turned from a small single principal investigator invest uh, type of uh, collaboration into a large collaboration. And I think this is the one important message that I want to bring also across from our community, the scientific computing community, to your community is, is that things have really changed. To quote one of my colleagues, the days are over that a professor in, say, a computational science area could assign a student to solve a problem, and the student would do this as a PhD thesis, that is, write a code and write the thesis and then be done with it. Today, the time it takes to get from an idea to a completion of the software exceeds the lifetime of a PhD. So what do two students do today? If they work together in larger groups, their collaborations, their software systems, very large computational modeling environments, and you add on to this environment. The cosmic microwave background computation community is one of those communities. Um, we have off the order of hundreds of users. They're all around a piece of software that is run at NERSC. 
These are inter again international collaborations. Some of the key users here are, for example, from Italy, in addition to many US users. And um, they are not just a single professor with a few PhD and postdocs, but it's a large community that integrates and works together, focused on the software, focused on the data and the collaborations. And that's the model we're moving into the future in computing. Now, why supercomputing? I mentioned earlier that you factor large covariance matrix. This is how the data sets have grown. So the matrix that you want to factor is of order NP by NP. So you really have a 10 to the 9 by 10 to the 9 matrix that in, say, 2020 you want to factor. And if you do quick exponential calculations in your mind, then you will figure out that this is of the order of 10 to the 27 operations. So we won't have a computer by 2020 to solve this, no matter how well the extrapolations are. So that means a lot of innovative algorithm research has to be coupled with progress in computing to make progress in science. So this is a very nice uh, sort of graphic rendition. This is sort of the resolution you saw at COBE. And with future satellites, you get a much higher resolution for cosmic background radiation. And of course, why do we want to do all this? This is because cosmology is a very open area again because there are big mysteries that uh, sort of were found out that we still have to resolve what is dark energy, what is dark matter. And understanding the cosmic microwave background radiation will give us some indication on at least one set of parameters which determine how our cosmos will really look like. So it's great science. That excites me, just like cognitive computing. So investments, I'm, I'm agnostic. I like everything. I like everything from the end of the universe to understanding how the brain works. But what I want to point out is, is that the model of computational science in the last 10 or 15 or 20 years has substantially changed that we're no longer doing single principle investigator science, but we're working in large collaborative teams. And the important thing is, is that these teams integrate mathematicians and computer scientists. And I think that's, that's an important cultural message for this community is, is that I think in order to make progress, we probably have to build these large scale teams. So, Coming to NERSC, uh, if you're an expert in this, you love to see this. As I, what I want to say here is just to give you a sort of a measure where we are today. NERSC just installed a system, a 100 teraflop system that is Cray, that's still Cray, uh, a long his, historic company in high performance computing that is still alive and well. And um, that's how the system looks. And what does 100 teraflop mean? If you haven't looked at this very much, these are the this is the top 500 list, the top uh, supercomputers. I'm a co-author of this list that is published twice a year in lists worldwide. Who has the biggest system and what are these biggest systems? That's the list from November. The next list will appear in June, and you see that. Blue Gene, the system that is with our colleagues right here also in the Bay Area at Lawrence Livermore National Labs, continues to be the number one system on the list. It has a 280.6 uh, teraflop uh, result on one of uh, the important benchmarks. And you see that the system we have in NERSC will fall somewhere in this category, so among the top 10 most powerful systems in the world. And you see, again, this is international. Uh, uh, it's not just sort of the weapons guys and uh, the old Department of Energy, but you have uh, here the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, uh, which is a very uh, intriguing center in, in Spain, the largest one in Europe. And you have um, uh, here a system at the Tokyo Institute of Technology, which is actually Sun NEC based, which is also used for basic science. So this is a dynamically changing, exciting community. And here in Berkeley, we have one of the largest resources around that supports that work. Uh, if you look at a 20-year history in supercomputing, you always get these charts. And you get, for me now, a set of charts and get used to this, which are logarithmic. And some stuff grows like crazy over the, has grown in the past and will continue to grow. So that's sort of the main idea. Here is our sequence of systems that we have at NERSC. And you see that up to the 100 teraflop now and something that we'll install in 2009, 2010, which may be a petaflop, 1,000 teraflops, uh, we've seen pretty much a progression on an exponential growth scale. And the reason that is happening is, of course, because Moore's law is driving the performance uh, also on the very high end. So again, coming back to the top 500 list, which, as I mentioned before, is just like the Fortune 500 listing the 500 most powerful supercomputers worldwide, you can make a lot of interesting observations on what's happening in high-performance computing and the technology trends. And again, you see this growth on a logarithmic scale. The number one system is growing here. That's the blue line. 
That is now, as I said before, the blue gene system is the number one system with about 270 teraflops, uh, 280 teraflops. Um, the interesting thing is, is that the number 500 system, that's the last one that's on the list, is also growing on the same exponential curve. And these uh, sort of steps that always happen when a new system is introduced, like for example, the famous Earth simulator in Japan, you might have heard that was introduced in 2002, you see big steps up. Uh, they get smoothed out if you add the 500 together. And the intriguing fact is, is that in 1993, when the list was published the first time, the total of the top 500 supercomputers in the world added up to a little bit over one teraflop. And today, in 2006, early 2007, if you buy a teraflop computer, you're not even on the list anymore. You're below 500. That growth can be sort of expressed this way. So for example, the number one system from 2000 would fall off the list in 2005. And if you plot, say, your average laptop here and put a laptop, say, at somewhere of a couple of hundred megaflops in 2003, 2004, and at the gigaflop in 2006, you see that this laptop I'm running the presentation from would have been probably number 300 on the top 500 list in 1993. So this tells you a little bit of what I want to do next, and this is to extrapolate where computing power goes in the future. So if we do this, and I have to pause here because intellectually that's a very, very dangerous thing to do because intellectually what I'm doing here is taking an exponential growth curve and extrapolating a straight line so it seems in the future. But if we do this, for example, so you get these curves to by 2015, where the high-performance computing technology will go. So you see that at around in this time frame we get uh, close to the 100 petaflop, the sum will be close to the exaflop level. Uh, but the most important thing is, is that if you look at the six to eight year transition, you see that, um, sorry, I was going backward. Nope. If you look at, this transi at these transitions, it takes about of the order eight to 10 years from the supercomputing technology to reach for laptop level, that's what I uh, just said before. So if we go into the future, um, we'll have laptops which will be more powerful and therefore desktops and under the desk machines than current supercomputers. Now, you'll say, well, this is the same as it was in the past, but I think there's, this is the second point I want to make here is there's a very crucial difference now if we go from today into the future, and I'll come to that next. And the crucial difference is, is that in the future, everything will be parallel. So in part, in the past, the parallelism has grown on these supercomputers, and uh, of course, that's expected. Those were the massively parallel supercomputers of the early 90s. And here you see how many processes were in the largest supercomputer in the top 500 in terms of parallelism. That's now over 100,000 in blue gene. The average one that has slowly grown to over 1,000. So right now you have 2,048 on the average system. And the smallest one has sort of stagnated at about 64. And so parallelism has gone up. But the important thing is, what parallelism do you have today in your laptop? Today in your laptop, you have maybe a dual core processor. And the important second lesson that I would like you to take away from my lecture is, is that it will not stay at dual core. As you know, everybody's talking about quad core, and Sun just announced a great new product with Rock, which has, I think, 32 cores. So you will see that the parallelism on the laptop will grow according to the same curves in the future. That's, of course, a prediction. But what it means is, is that parallelism is there for everybody. And what that means is, is that in the long term, the transition from here, from your environment, from your desktop or laptop environment to a supercomputing file environment is going to be much more seamless. Because at this point in time, the Microsofts and Intels have to think about parallelism. It's not just the craze and, and high-end companies. So this is a fundamental change in what's going to happen in the next couple of years. So here's a curve from my colleagues. Uh, this is a group of uh, folks. Kunle Lockhart is at Stanford. Burton Smith is at Microsoft. Um, they looked at those trends, and basically all of us know that Moore's law continues. We put more and more transistors per chip, but there was this important point in 2004, and actually you could put the timestamp on it. In September 2004, Intel declared they will abandon one project and will not crank up the clock anymore. And so what you see now on all microprocessors is that pretty much everything has stalled. And what has stalled is both the number of, of in a sense, the clock speed, we were sort of stalled at maybe three, four gigahertz. What has stalled is for power consumption. That's another limit. 
And what is stalled is sort of the automatic parallelism, instruction level parallelism. So we're building computers with more transist tra transistors, but architecturally we have stalled. So what is going to be done is, is that multi-core. Everybody builds multi-core processors. Is multi-core the correct response? That's a big debate. And I'd like to point to a paper that has been written, the few from Berkeley. Here's the Golden Gate Bridge, and that's sort of the few from Berkeley. Uh, but what it means is that the few from Berkeley is, is multi-core really the correct way of going about in the future and using the additional transistors? It's really, if you look at the Intels and AMDs, sort of the quick and easy way. They can't think of anything else what they do with the extra transistors, so they do the same processor over and over again and put more cores on the chip. But um, the way Dave Patterson puts it is this really the industry has thrown down sort of in football terminology the Hail Mary pass. The, ball is, the football is in the air, and the community is not even running yet because most of us don't even think about the question, what are we going to do with all these four, or eight, or 16, or 32-way parallelism that will come on chips. Uh, the big ones are now gradually waking up to this, and uh, there are, there's quite of interest in, in addressing the chip-based parallelism. But this is the big revolution. There's another thing in there, and this is what I'm implicitly saying here. We're not sure that multi-core is really the right way of using all the transistors. There's really a possibility to open up architecture research again, as it hasn't been opened up in 20 years. We have lived in a monoculture determined by the Intel 386 architecture for 20 years. Here's a chance, chance to break this monoculture and do something completely different in the future. And so just one of the announcements of the last week, IBM announced that they put the cell processor, which came out of the Sony-Toshiba collaboration, for the PlayStation into what you might call a mainframe. And so you have an innovation of a game processor being used for mainstream mainframe computing. You have NVIDIA, another game processor company that is going pretty much mainstream. They're now a $500 million business, but only 10% of their revenue is coming actually out of games. The rest is coming out of all types of other applications. So the microprocessor world is changing, but it sure is going to be parallel. So this is the slide going out into the far future. And again, I want to point out that by 2025, if we have laptops in 2025, you will have off the order of between 10 and 100,000 processors on your laptop. Now, you should pause and say, hey, that doesn't make sense at all. And I agree, this is a straight future extrapolation. It doesn't really make sense because in 1987, I didn't have a laptop either because that wasn't invented yet. So there's sort of the, all the other stuff that we can invent with these parallel systems is also out there in the future, but assuming that works. So everybody noticed this exponential growth in computing, and now I switch to sort of what I call the other side. This is Ray Kurzweil has sort of pointed this out in his books that there is an exponential growth. And I'm coming now to a set of slides which look very much like the top 500 slides, but they have one little thing added to it. And here's sort of the Kurzweil version, which says everything is grown exponentially. And then I draw lines across. And here say, this is, quote, the intelligence of a mosquito or a mouse of a human brain. This is all humanity together. And those charts were published on and off over the last couple of years. Now, my problem with these charts is that I have had, in 2000, a computer that was an IBM system that had the power, of the, according to this chart, of a mosquito. And I currently have acquired a system at NERSC that has the intellectual power of a mouse. But realistically speaking, my computer at NERSC can't do anything of the stuff that mice or mosquitoes can do. I mean, absolutely not. I mean, if I, sh if, if I walk with a piece of meat in front of a computer, the computer doesn't recognize that's something edible. And if I show a rocket, the computer doesn't recognize that it's not edible, and the mosquito knows that. So these charts have some fundamental problem. Here's another one that's Hans Moravec and CACM. Same thing. Computer power is growing. Here's intellectual. And there's sort of this implicit assumption that by building something bigger and bigger, by making these quantitative changes, we suddenly get a quality of change. And I just don't believe that this sudden jump into the quality of change will happen by itself. Um, it's, it's sort of like we turn on our computer and suddenly it thinks about food. Um, this is a real simplistic view that I believe is wrong and misleading. Um, one of the main reasons why it's misleading is an obvious one is, is that we have built very, very special purpose architectures. If you go back 50 years and ask why do we build computers that we build today, floating point intensive systems, it's very simple because the first driver for computers in the Cold War area were nuclear weapon simulations. 
all the early development of high performance computers were done at places like Los Alamos and at Livermore, and they were done for doing computational physics. So we have actually, on the high performance computing world, fairly highly tuned, sophisticated machines that do one thing really well, that is solving the numerical, numerically the equations of computational physics with high floating point calibration. And actually, uh, what you have in your, in, in, a, in a sense, in, in your environment is, is just a derivative of that. There is no other architecture than the von Neumann architecture and then replicated multiple times as a parallel system. So the, the architectures have, architecture world has very little, has paid very little attention to other applications outside what I would say the traditional computational physics world. But there's also slow progress in mathematical models for cognitive process. Yes, you all have worked on this for 20 or 30 years or so. But this is our difficult problems, and I think there were insufficient resources put into this field to actually make progress. It has not gotten the attention that understanding how to blow up things have gotten. So that's sort of the second thing. We have, and, and there has been a gap between the two, and I think that gap can be closed. So let me conclude with two history lessons and then uh, one final statement here. Um, I'm only going back 20 years. There's maybe a longer history, as Robert Heck Nielsen told me before we started here. Um, there was sort of a point of opportunity, I think, 20 years ago. In 1987, the connection machine, CM2, was introduced. That actually came out of the artificial intelligence community. So there was an expectation that this machine could be used, at least in the AI world. I mean, I'm not sure if there was any attempt even made by folks who do cognitive modeling and, and neural modeling to, to look at this machine, but there was at least that connection out there. Um, the CM2 is, has evolved into a CM5, and exactly because of the pressure for funding from DARPA pushed thinking machines to go much more into developing a machine that was no longer the bit serial 64,000 processor machine that was the CM2, but a much more traditional MPP that became the CM5. So there was an opportunity, and I think the opportunity that was lost was that there was really, the two communities never really got together on this. And I think there was some early work, and I also saw Pendy Kanefra in the audience, who was together with me in 1987 at NASA when we got one of those machines, and his group at that time was looking at the connection machine. And I think, unfortunately, a lot of this early work that could have been potentially fruitful has been pretty much lost. I want to give an anecdote on the aside. I mean, how much things have been lost. I'm teaching, um, we have summer students coming in every year. And so there are 25, 30 summer students coming in, and I give them a welcome talk about high performance computing. So I show them slides like this. And I ask them, who has heard about thinking machines? And the answer was as follows. In 2001 or 2002, out of 25 people still had three new about thinking machines. In 2004, nobody knew anymore about thinking machines. It disappeared. It's out of our history. And if you go back, unfortunately, this is just pre-World Wide Web days. And so there is very little out there that today's computer scientists and computer science, future computer science researchers really know about what was done in the 80s. So this is just an anecdote. We, we also, as a community, are not very historical. And even those of us, and I see many of you probably know thinking machines, will, will forget about things. Lesson number two, 10 years ago, who wouldn't remember, that was when Deep Blue beat Gary Kasparov. It happened to be actually May 1997, exactly 10 years ago. This was one of the biggest success stories of machine intelligence. I'm not even talking about uh, cognitive computing, just about mach machine intelligence. What have we learned from this? So my point here is we have almost learned nothing from this. We have learned that it's possible to build such a machine and develop software to accomplish something which was seen up to that point as a feat that only humans could do. But we have done no bit of further analysis. Not even the chess computing experts have sort of used that and tried to understand. I mean, we have not learned anything from Deep Blue in terms of it didn't teach us anything about how a chess grandmaster thinks. And so there is another opportunity lost. And so um, now we're coming to 2007 in my short history. I think today we have, again, an opportunity. And I think the opportunity is, is that we have maybe 20 years, we have 30 years of missed chances. I think chances are that 2007 could be different. One of it is that all of us are here in this room and trying to make that connection possibly happen. But as I said, the true massive parallelism will happen. It will happen everywhere. Everything will be parallel. It will radically change architectures. I don't know what computers or processes we'll use in five years. I just know that they will be highly parallel. 
But that gives an opportunity to actually rethink computer architecture and do with these massive amounts of transistors per chip something new and build possibly cognitive computers or computers that are more suitable for cognitive tasks. And on the other side, I think what we've come to realize is also on the physics, chemistry side of the world that the model of collaboration is actually one of large teams, large groups, building code and software infrastructures. And I think that this model is probably also necessary for this community to really harness the power of, of supercomputing. So with these thoughts, I hope I gave you some things to discuss in the coffee break and take into the meeting. Uh, that's why I'm here. That's why I think there are great opportunities in bringing supercomputing and cognitive computing together. And I like to extend again the best wishes of Nurse and Lawrence Berkeley up to the success of this meeting. Thank you. Time for a couple of quick questions. First of all, thank you, of course, for enlightening yeah. us and Thanks. giving us an overview of where is the cognitive computing and the supercomputing actually connectivity is at. So if anybody has a question for uh, a few quick questions. So first you mentioned you know, this uh, falling off of the list of the phenomena. Yeah. Does it, is it just off of that chart? I mean, how about memory? Does it just fall off in all respects, communication? No, it is only floating point performance. That's one of the shortcomings on the list that it only focuses on this one characteristic. If we were to look at memory, the, the, that would be a different list. Can you introduce yourself? My name is uh, Guru. Uh, for daytime, I work for Lockheed. Uh, back then, I like cognitive computing. Uh, on, the, on the abstract computing model, do you think you're going to revisit some of the valiant thought on uh, building abstract, abstract computing models? Um, that, that's possible. I think, as I said, architecture experimentation gives us the opportunity to try out things that were more in the theoretical realm. And what's true about all the theoretical computer science research in terms of algorithms for PRAM and other models falls in the same category. I think the rest of us sort of have not looked at this literature because it was sort of seen as a theoretical uh, enterprise and not relevant. I think there's a possibility that this can come together with, with real machines now. Yes. Thank you. Um, when you're looking for input from biology and so forth, from time to time people be, build special purpose computers like a retina or something like that. And right. My impression is that that's fine and two things happen. First, the operating system and software isn't so good for the special purpose computer and then within a few years, which you probably know better than I do, it's overtaken by some general purpose computer. Do you see any lost opportunities or any better way to take care of things like that? Um, I, I very much agree with your second observation. I think this is why we have seen very little in terms of outside this monoculture of computers built out of a standard architecture, simply because the speeding up the clock uh, always produced within 18 months to three years a faster general purpose system than the special purpose system. What I'm claiming here, which is of course open to debate, is, is that this may be different in the future because in the future it's only architecture that differentiates products. Clocks will not increase because we cannot heat, handle the heat and power consumption. So we have to go to parallelism or something else. And something else means all kinds of experimentation is out in the open. And so a lot of people now use FPGAs for tasks that were con where FPGAs were done too, thought too slow. So there is the possibility of creating an environment, and this is a project here in Berkeley, the RAMP project, where you can actually build in FPGAs, possible architectures, try them out, and then reconfigure those architectures, even parallel architectures. So I think there is, I know why things didn't work in the past, but I think they may now happen again in the future. One last question. Thank you. Uh, Steve Beck, Visiting Fellow, College of Engineering. Do you think flops will continue to be the metric in this new space, or will there be some new, better metric, and what might it be besides floating point operations per second? Yeah, that's a real good question. Um, as one of the authors for the top 500 list, I very much regret, actually, that flops is driving us so much and that the list is based so much on flops because it biases the spectrum of computers. There have been, at least in our community, for many years, efforts to change the metric, introduce multiple metrics, but uh, we're, driv we're still sort of driven by the industry. The industry loves simple metrics, and so they look at high-end computing at Linpack flops, and they look at spec, and that's that. 
And so um, I think as a community, if we find a way of measuring performance better in a particular subfield, uh, we may come up with a different metric. But unfortunately, I think things are very much still driven by flops. Thank so, you. Uh, with that, I would like again to thank you, Horst Simon, uh, on behalf of the organizing committee, uh, Robert Atkinson from UC San Diego, and Darmendra from IBM. Thank you for being here.